into talking about hypertension and a similar project with hypertension. And then we're going to do questions after I finish and what and Jill, Jill Meyer is going to talk about uh, a, 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 the uh, maternal early warning system. So I'm going to turn to the hypertension safety bundle, which is the second national consensus bundle that's coming out. This is going to be a few more months delayed. Uh, we also did a lot of work on this in California uh, with a, a group led by Maury Drusen and Larry Shields at uh, Stanford. Uh, and that, that has gotten serious play as well. So we're going to talk, we're going to outline the bundle, which is set up in a similar way, but we're going to talk more about uh, the changes in ACOG uh, recommendations for the management of preeclampsia that came out this last year. And there are four key take-home lessons for the care of uh, women with preeclampsia. No financial disclosures again. Uh, and again, this is part of a national partnership of maternal safety. Uh, so the algorithm is similarly designed, readiness and recognition. You know, this is, should be basic stuff, but unfortunately it is missing in many of our units, that you have a unit standard protocol for the treatment of severe hypertension. Uh, new onset acute hypertension is a pretty standardized protocol now. Uh, that you have a standardized protocol for administration of magnesium uh, and when to use it. Uh, and that you have rapid access to these medications uh, and uh, an appropriate consultation and maternal transport, particularly for severe early onset preeclampsia. The recognition, there's uh, you know, one of my, f I won't say favorite occupations on labor and delivery is to, uh, is to observe how nurses do blood pressures and nurses strive very hard to get the lowest blood pressure they can get. Uh, turning the patient, you know, putting the patient in bed, turning her on her side uh, and measuring on the upper arm, you know, any way they can to get the lowest blood pressure, which is not the goal, of course, though that seems to be the intent. Um, and so there's education on very simple things like that that are important. Um, so what kind of things did we see in California on preeclampsia? A lot of missed triggers on this one, uh, particularly blood pressure triggers, both systolic and diastolics. You know, what the feeling is if we just, she's in pain, it'll go down, it will... Uh, she's nervous, it'll go down, you know, just denial and delay again for hypertension as we saw for hemorrhage. Uh, but people ignoring O2 saturation values, you know, 92, 91. Uh, and again, she's, uh, they could find reasons to uh, ignore it or to overlook it. Altered mental status was also one that was overlooked in a number of our deaths. And actually, it's sort of interesting, the fetus can be a barometer of health in the mother. That fetal distress can be a sign that the mother's uh, hemodynamics and circulation is not optimized. We saw a, a, uh, a widespread failure to use uh, magnesium for severe preeclampsia. And most important of all was the underutilization of blood pressure medications. But this is one uh, that really needs to be worked, is the difficulty of getting the obstetrician to the bedside. Okay. In a private, in a community hospital setting where you don't have in-house physicians, this is a real important thing and I think this can only be addressed by having some standardized protocols and having maternal early warning system with uh, a, a unit consensus. But preeclampsia also has issues beyond labor and delivery. Uh, this is a PACU issue, this is a postpartum issue, and importantly an ED issue. And we had emergency department members on our committee, because these are people that you'll see that come back uh, days or weeks later with hypertension that's very severe by obstetric standards, but not severe by the ED standards, and have gotten lost in that shuffle. So uh, there are a couple of very good resources from New York and California uh, on uh, looking at systems changes on many different levels. And we're going to concentrate on four issues here. Uh, making the right diagnosis, there are new criteria for preeclampsia that we'll go through, uh, but treating the damn blood pressure. I don't know, I can't say this too often to obstetric 
uh, and nursing audiences, but this is really the key. Uh, and then there's now a lot of work on not delivering too early for mild and not delivering uh, too late for severe hypertension, for severe preeclampsia, uh, and the importance of early postpartum follow-up. So this was a major work by le multiple leaders uh, around the country, uh, multiple leaders in preeclampsia around the country that came out uh, in late 2013. It's a white paper. Uh, this is the executive summary. It's over 130 pages in fullness. Uh, and it had a number of changes that you all should be aware of. First of all, we changed the name. You know, that's what you like to do. Every white paper, every 10 years. It's now preeclampsia with severe features, formerly known as mild, and preeclampsia with or without severe features. And they, they correlate to mild or severe. There's actually a large amount of blood lost on this piece of work because there was a lot of concern whether there was a moderate preeclampsia, which we all know exists. You know, if you don't quite get to 160 over 110, but are, have symptoms, you're probably more than mild, but maybe not yet meet the criteria for severe. That did not make the final cut. But what's different is that proteinuria is no longer required to diagnose preeclampsia. Okay? It's a typical feature, but it's not required. And we've I'm, I practice maternal fetal medicine. We certainly see a lot of atypical preeclampsia who do not have hypertension. Neither is five grams in 24 hours a criteria for severe preeclampsia. That's a change. And that's something that also reflects current practice is that uh, it really didn't make much difference for the maternal or baby outcomes if you had five or six grams. It was a marker of, uh, of renal uh, of holes in the, in the glomeruli leading to proteinuria, but not necessarily other maternal illness. Big focus here on treatment of a 160 over 110. Uh, actually, there's a huge debate whether it's 105 over 110. In the end, it probably doesn't matter uh, as long as you have a formalized approach to treat. And then there's a backing off of magnesium for mild preeclampsia, uh, or preeclampsia without severe features, as it's called but a big push uh, for treatment with severe preeclampsia. Big recognition, recognition that the earlier the onset of preeclampsia, the more severe it is. So if you have preeclampsia 20, 32 weeks, that's a severe disease. And, and that included in our maternal mortalities, it was more common in that age than at, at term. Uh, so this is probably also a criteria for movement of a patient to a higher level hospital rather than a level one hospital. The controversial one is that patients with any diagnosis of preeclampsia should be delivered at 37 weeks. And we're going to show some of that data and a recognition the postpartum period is, is a dangerous time. So uh, women don't die very commonly of eclampsia unless there's airway obstruction. They die of stroke. Uh, this is uh, our data in California. Uh, Two-thirds of the deaths were strokes. Uh, uh, four were liver failure, two were cardiac failure, uh, DIC, multiple failure. This is very similar to what you see in the United Kingdom, the confidential inquiries, uh, really leading to the recognition of treating the blood pressure to prevent the stroke. This is data now from Jim Martin, uh, who works in Mississippi and, and in Tennessee, where they have a very large rate of severe preeclamptics. Uh, and over time, they were looking at uh, collecting cases of strokes and, and could show that the blood pressure uh, uh, pre-stroke on the right-hand side can be as low as 159. Uh, it averaged 175. But uh, that uh, you don't have to be 180 to have a stroke. 160 can be enough. Uh, therefore, that's the, the pressure to treat. So we worked hard in, in our first collaborative in California uh, to try and reduce maternal morbidity. Uh, you know, our aim was to, to taking patients with severe disease, either uh, preeclampsia was superimposed, which is worse than uh, superimposed on chronic pre, uh, hypertension or severe preeclampsia, 
uh, and to uh, reduce postpartum length of stay and to increase the proportion of women who were treated within 30 or 60 minutes if they had severe hypertension. So we worked with um, uh, uh, educating our, our doctors and nurses on the new cars, laminated cars for the blood pressure uh, protocols that ACOG has put out, uh, standard order sets and our EHRs and debriefs and s s feedback of, of lessons learned from each case, which I, can't, I don't want to underestimate the importance of that. Uh, so the, the blood pressure medication protocols are pretty straightforward, but they're not. I can't believe how many times people have trouble with labetalol and not do the escalating dose. Even in my unit, in which I've railed, we have this posted, they go 20, 20, 20, and not 20, 40, 80. It's, it's a medicine that has quite a variable response. Uh, some people respond to 20. Some people only respond when you're at 80, and some people don't respond at all. Uh, the other medication, hydralazine, we've used my whole career, uh, and it actually is pretty effective, but it does lead to more headaches and, and, uh, and a, perhaps a little bit more potential for hypertension, though we're investigating that. Uh, but what's interesting is that if one doesn't work, almost always the other one does. So you, you, the new protocols are you, you try several doses of one. If you haven't gotten a response, you switch to the alternative medicine, which has a different mechanism of action. It has been very rare that we need to go to uh, other IV medications, such as an IV beta blocker or, or even stronger medicines. These two work probably 95% of the time, one or the other, if they're used in appropriate levels. Now, what we saw was that there are a lot of barriers to using IV medications on many units on labor and delivery. In any PDF, any quality improvement project, you do a PDSA cycle, and you do, first you want to look at what the barriers are and then what the strategies for overcoming them. And that's what we did first. And it was really eye-opening what the barriers are for giving IV labetalol, IV hydralazine on labor and delivery units. First one is pretty, uh, that's okay. If the blood pressure's down, before the medicine is available, you don't have to give it. But there's a lot of, of misunderstanding, either both on the doctors and the nursing side, about what blood pressure parameters to use, uh, competing priorities, let's get the mag in or let's do something else first before we treat the blood pressure. Uh, there was uh, unable to access medications because they had to get it from pharmacy. Uh, a lot of RNs, particularly in small and medium units, are not used to giving IV medications. Uh, and some, some uh, units still have prohibitions about IV libido, needs to have a cardiac monitor, some of these things that don't apply to this patient population and aren't, aren't widely used, but may have still be the protocol in that hospital that you have to recognize and change. Uh, some of them was dependent on the MD being present. And if the MD's, you know, at home, uh, that's not a good combination for treatment of severe preeclampsia. Okay, you need to have the physician, the obstetrician available. Uh, and then the last one is really kind of interesting. There was pretty widespread fear of hypotension. I don't want to treat the mother because then I'll have hypotension and there'll be uh, baby concerns. So that was one thing we wanted to study directly. Uh, uh, so we, we looked at process measures, including severe hypertension treated under 60 minutes. Uh, and then our outcomes were looking at severe maternal morbidity, the CDC measure, among women with severe, hyper, uh, severe hypertension. So this is timely treatment within 60 minutes. And the baseline, retrospective as it was, was 30 to 40 percent were treated uh, in uh, only 30 to 40 percent were treated within 60 minutes, which is a fairly long time and we got it up to 80, 80%. Although this is a kind of a fun way of charting uh, uh, an outcome or a process measure. Uh, this is month to month in one hospital uh, timing for treatment and green is 30 minutes, light green is 60 minutes, yellow is 60 to 90, orange is greater than 90 and uh, red is not at all. And you know, it doesn't, you know, it's pretty easy to see the progress here with more and more green showing up. 
Uh, and we got it up to 100% by the end. Uh, we're treated within 60 minutes. And then severe maternal morbidity. Again, these are, are disease conditions such as uh, pulmonary edema, uh, uh, ARDS, renal failure, uh, and, and this is only among the women with severe preeclampsia. This did in also include uh, at one level with uh, transfusions. And we can see there's a fair amount of morbidity here. Uh, baseline is about 20% of patients, and we got it down to uh, 12, 15% uh, over that uh, of six, five quarters uh, in this collaborative. What was an interesting finding, though, which uh, I think is germane to everyone here, is that preeclampsia is highly correlated with postpartum hemorrhage. A lot of the morbidity we saw with preeclampsia was hemorrhage and transfusion. So be, be on the alert for that. Debriefing uh, was very important. That improved. Uh, now we monitored for dive for hypotension here. And this was an interesting process because well, this was our balancing measure. You know, anytime you do a quality improvement project, you want to be able to, to balance uh, your interventions, assuming you're going to do good, but you're not guaranteed you're going to be doing good. You want to have a, something to show you're not doing harm at the same time. The potential harm of treatment here is, but then is well, are you going to have uh, so much hypotension that you're going to have fetal, uh, fetal distress, which is certainly in our textbooks, and we've all seen a case, you see it occasionally with hypotension from epidural administration where you'll have uh, a, a fetal response to the maternal low blood pressure. So we were surprised that with the use of these drugs, uh, and we're analyzing whether one drug is more common than another, that 35% of the women had diastolics that went from 110 to below 80. Okay. The goal is to end up around 90, but it's hard to, to titrate these meds. Then we looked to see how many women actually had a fetal heart rate category change after, after, after treatment. And this was ended up being a very low number. Uh, for the last two quarters in this whole, in the whole collaborative, that was zero. But it ended up being about 1.5% for the whole collaborative. So the heart rate, the blood pressure may drop to 80 temporarily, below 80, but it's, it hasn't been associated with any significant fetal effects in at the 99% range. So we're going to turn now to timing of delivery, which has also been a controversial change in, in obstetrics. Uh, and here ACOG is being more directed than it's been in the past on this. Uh, if, you are, if you have preeclampsia with severe features, again, severe features of preeclampsia would be diastolic, uh, blood pressure is 160 over 110, uh, low platelets or HELP syndrome, uh, proteinuria edema, uh, major comp, but the, excluding the proteinuria, excluding, actually excluding IUGR, that's no longer a criteria. Those are women, if you're over 34 weeks at the time of diagnosis, you deliver. Okay. So 35 weeks you deliver, anytime you make the diagnosis at that point. If you're under 34 weeks, these are folks that should be taken care of. It's okay to consider if the mother is stable enough for, and for corticosteroids for fetal lung maturation, but this is a setting that's at very high risk and should be taken care of at a tertiary center. Now, the controversial one is uh, what do you do with preeclampsia without severe features? Uh, you know, you're 140 over 90, 1, 2 plus proteinuria, the typical preeclampsia we see. Uh, these can be managed fine even as an outpatient. Uh, if the labs are stable and done uh, up to 37 weeks, not delivered before 37 weeks, but delivered at 37 to 38 weeks. And that's the concept that you don't continue waiting to 38 to 39 weeks. Uh, this is based on a very large trial, a randomized trial from the Netherlands called HIPATAT. Uh, and it compared induction or expected management of preeclampsia after 36 weeks. Uh, with almost 400 in each arm, uh, and the, they were, the, the major primary outcome was if you waited, did you have more poor maternal outcomes? More deaths, more eclampsia, more help, more pulmonary edema, more abruptions, which are all complications of progressive preeclampsia, and postpartum hemorrhage, again, for that matter. 
And the second, and, and what they found was that there was less progression to severe preeclampsia and major complications in the mother if you induced at 37 weeks than if you had expectant management, uh, uh, a reduction of 30%. There were no deaths seen in this small, relatively smaller sample size of 400 for eclampsia, but there was much less maternal morbidity. Now, it, it actually, it's uh, interesting that, you know, that the concern is if you're inducing a lot of women to 37 weeks, are you going to have more C-sections among them? They actually had a decreased C-section rate when they induced to 37 weeks, largely because the maternal condition was better at that point and not as severe as if you waited until the mother got severe preeclampsia uh, and then you tried to deliver them and you didn't have as much time before the mother's condition uh, affected the baby's condition. Okay, now, follow-up. Uh, the old teaching was it's over when the baby and the placenta are delivered because we know preeclampsia is related to the uh, placental re release of factors that control the mother's uh, circulation and the mother's endothelial cell function. Uh, and it's not over, our new teaching is not over until uh, full diuresis, normalization of blood pressure, off of medications, and even then you have to be careful. Uh, one of the things that's been noted, and this is germane everywhere, is the role of NSAIDs uh, in blood pressure. In internal medicine, there's a pretty large literature that I was initially unaware of as, uh, linking NS chronic NSAID use or even uh, days and weeks of NSAID use uh, to rises in blood pressure in women with chronic hypertension, not, not pregnant women. And it appears to be more in some, in some women who are sensitive and not very much in others. Uh, in probably in our unit, 95% of women get an NSAID postpartum, Motrin or the equivalent. And it probably is okay in most, but if you have a woman who has persistent postpartum hypertension, one of the things to think about is not is to stop the NSAIDs. We're not saying don't give the NSAIDs because this is probably one of the better alternatives we have, but you have to be more cautious in women with preeclampsia. You have to be particularly if the blood pressure is persistent post-delivery. Uh, one of the better blood pressure medicines to use postpartum is nifedipine. It promotes GFR and helps with the diuresis, and that, uh, probably better better choice than labetalol. Now, it is not over when, just when the placenta is out. There is a real phenomena of late postpartum eclampsia, up to four weeks postpartum, uh, as much as one-sixth of all the cases of eclampsia, and this was women who weren't necessarily preeclamptic pre-delivery. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily those who have the highest blood pressure. But they present with headache uh, and other prodromal vis uh, blurry vision and typical things that you see with preeclampsia symptom-wise. When you look at our deaths in preeclampsia, only two-thirds happen in that first week. See, so there's a lot that are, you know, the second week there were some mothers who had a stroke in the first week and then died in the second week. But these others were late deaths or late presentation of preeclampsia. Uh, and so this led us to really focus on follow-up of what happens when mothers uh, go home or discharged from the hospital. Are they getting adequate education about signs and symptoms to look for? And are our ER physicians, if they come back with uh, severe headaches or chest pain, or, uh, or just high blood pressure to the emergency department, are they being recognized? And that's part of our, our toolkit rollout in California uh, was to work with the EDs. And in, to, in an ED, you know, the most important person is the triage nurse. Uh, and to have a triage question is, are you now or have you recently been pregnant? Uh, and that really changes the mindset then, because a lot of these women came in six weeks, four weeks postpartum, and no one had a clue that they had, were recently postpartum. Uh, but if you have that as a mindset, that's a, a different way of looking at that patient, and we're strongly recommending that they, they would have any obstetric consultation at the very least 
you know, people who are familiar with preeclampsia. So we worked a lot with patient organizations. Uh, there's a preeclampsia foundation that is really focused on communication issues, which has been an issue in preeclampsia in terms of folks not knowing what to look for. Uh, and so this is a tear sheet, for example, that we're giving to mothers on the, uh, of what to look for. When you think about prenatal care, what happens in a, in a doctor midwife's office every single visit? It's you measure the blood pressure, you look for protein in the urine, you, look, you do a weight, you know, looking for recent sudden weight gains. Those are all screening tests for preeclampsia. Most of postpartum uh, and a part of prenatal care in the second half of pregnancy is focused on preeclampsia detection when you get down to it. So this, this is a nice resource. Uh, so we were happy with using severe maternal morbidity as an outcome measure, and we could show a decline in that. Postpartum length of stay was not a very effective. Actually, women, st uh, when you look at, at folks who stay in the hospital longer than three standard deviations, which is four days for a vaginal delivery, six days for a C-section, almost a, more than a third, almost half of those mothers have preeclampsia, and it's about blood pressure regulation and watching. So that was being proposed a couple years ago as a quality marker. Uh, we think it's not a good measure for that because those are appropriate uh, lengths of stay. Uh, we really are strong believers in treating blood pressure uh, under, in under 60 minutes and striving for even shorter than that and the importance of debriefs of all severe hypertension cases to come to look at systems issues again. Uh, and we found hospitals that were very shy about using magnesium even in severe hypertension, uh, severe preeclamptic cases. And that uh, some of our hospitals were very good at this and others were not. So that's something that should be a, uh, something to look at in your facility. And lastly, there should not be a fear of hypotension. You should not, not treat the severe hypertension in fear of hypotension. The baby should do fine after that. So thank you. I've talked long enough this morning. We're going to have a lot of time for discussion. I think we have a good 30, 40 minutes. So I'm going to turn it over to our next speaker. Mm -hmm.